Good evening. I'm David Ferriero, the Archivist of the United States, and it's a pleasure to welcome you this evening to the William G. McGowan Theater at the National Archives. And welcome, a special welcome to those of you who are joining us on our YouTube channel. Tonight we present our ninth annual McGowan Forum on Women in Leadership. Tonight, from the computer age to the digital age. This program will focus on the innovative and brilliant women in technology. We have an extraordinary panel who will discuss changes in the experiences, opportunities, and responsibilities for women in this field. And we'll present film clips about women who have paved the way for those in the forefront today. This topic, computer technology, is one that affects us all. Here at the National Archives, for example, we are digitizing our 13 billion pages as quickly as possible <laughs> with the help of volunteers willing to go through the endless numbers of boxes of records that date back to our revolution. Before we move on to tonight's program, however, I'd like to tell you about two other programs coming up soon in this theater. On Wednesday, April 13th at 7 p.m., a panel will discuss Life for African Americans in the District of Columbia before the 1862 Compensated Emancipation Act. The program is presented in partnership with the National Museum of African American History and Culture, the DC Commission on African American Affairs, and the DC Commission on Emancipation. And on Thursday, April 21st at 7, we'll discuss the book, Eye on the 60s, the iconic photography of Roland Sherman. The film will provide an intimate portrait of former Life magazine photographer Roland Sherman and will be followed by a discussion by the filmmaker and one of Sherman's most famous images, then 12-year-old Edith Lee Payne at the 1963 March on Washington. If you want to know more about these and all of our public programs, there are copies of all of our monthly calendar of events in the lobby as well as sign-up sheets where you can receive the calendar in regular mail or by email. And another way to get more involved in the National Archives is to become a member of the National Archives Foundation, and you'll soon hear more about that. Tonight's program is presented um, with the generous support of the Foundation, the National Archives Foundation, and the William G. McGowan Charitable Fund. And we thank them both for the continued support of programs here over the years. Now I'd like to introduce the chair of the National Archives Foundation, the noted journalist and author and film star, Alelia Bundles. How oh, that David Ferriero, the archivist of the United States, is such a comedian. <laughs> Thank you very much, David. Uh, and on behalf of the Board of Directors of the National Archives Foundation, it is my pleasure to welcome you to the ninth annual McGowan Forum on Women in Leadership. And I thank all of you who came tonight, even though it's 70 degrees outside and cherry blossoms are there, you want to fill your minds with something really interesting. So thank you for coming. As the National Archives nonprofit partner, the foundation generates financial and creative support for the National Archives exhibitions and public programs and educational initiatives. I invite all of you who are here tonight and everyone who is watching online to visit the Foundation's website at archivesfoundation.org. You can sign up for our monthly newsletter so that you will be the first to be in the know for all the upcoming programs and events. How many of you have been here before? Good, good, you are. And how many haven't been here before? Well, welcome. We are really glad you are here tonight. So you know, those of you who've been here know that this theater uh, where you are gathered and the program you're about to see tonight really exists because of the generosity of one of our most important partners, the William G. McGowan Charitable Fund. The McGowan Fund is a philanthropic family foundation established in 1992 to celebrate William McGowan's tradition of compassionate philanthropy and ethical leadership. The vision of the fund is to impact lives today, create sustainable change, and empower future generations to achieve their greatest potential. In addition to the support of the National Archives Foundation, the Chicago-based McGowan Charitable Fund promotes 
nurtures, and funds many other signature programs throughout the United States. We are especially grateful to have on our board the fund's executive director, Diana Spencer, who is here with us tonight. And we are also very pleased to have with us Leo McGowan, the president of the board of directors of the William G. McGowan Charitable Fund. <laughs> whose ongoing support not only of this program, but many of our programs throughout the year is very much appreciated. So I'm gonna welcome Leo to the stage. I had the chance to have a very nice conversation with him and his wife, Michelle, and his oldest daughter, Megan, who's a freshman in college, who I guess, hopefully this is spring break and you aren't cutting, <laughs> cutting class, but they, they tried to tell me a few secrets about him, but I, I really couldn't get much out of them except he has a very old telephone. <laughs> Thank you. The only, only reasons, the only reason they didn't give any uh, secrets is I have the car keys to get them home, so. <laughs> so. Good evening. I proudly represent the William G. McGowan Fund, which was established in 1993 to preserve the legacy of Bill McGowan, CEO of telecommunications giant MCI, Groundbreaking global, inter, uh, groundbreaking global business leader, entrepreneur, and my beloved uncle. It's actually funny to say all the things about him because to us and the family, he was just Uncle Bill. So, but in 1993, the McGowan Fund partnered with the National Archives to develop this public theater. It's a tribute to my Uncle Bill's abiding affection for history, movies, and exploring the issues of today. And then the McGowan Fund which is led by my Uncle Bill's uh, widow, Sue Jim McGowan, soon developed two lively public forums for the National Archives. Sue, who died suddenly in uh, 2014, was a legendary Chinese-American entrepreneur who portrayed her power and prestige in helping, provide level, helping to provide and help level the playing field for women and minorities. But after launching the annual fall forum, where industry government leaders explored topics in commerce, technology, and government, Sue spearheaded this annual Spring Forum Women in Leadership. Tonight's program marks the ninth consecutive year the Spring Forum has offered free public conversation spotlighting women in business, journalism, academia, arts, science, and medicine. Sue would have been thrilled to join, join here tonight, and she would have definitely taken notes. Although Sue herself was technically challenged. She <laughs> She always, yeah, as my wife and daughter here are laughing, we all understand Sue and technology was not a good mix. <laughs> but, you know, Sue was always open to the next new and big idea. She respected computer technology and its momentum for driving of progress. She was, and she was also proud that my Uncle Bill overturned AT&T's monopolistic lock on the U.S. phone service and opened up the vast technology and progress in that industry. Since its inception, the McGowan Fund has gifted over $130 million in the areas of human services, healthcare, medical research, and education. The McGowan Fund is always and consistently reevaluating itself. And we remain closely tuned to the developments in our world today. An example being homelessness is, a, is growing at an alarming rate through all, area, all sectors of the society. To help address the widening chasm, the fund supports community-based human service projects with the potential to produce sustainable change for the homeless. The goal is to promote self-sufficiency, sustainability, and the opportunities for the homeless to gain living wages. The synergy between the McGowan Fund and the National Archives, there is many synergies. Both are dedicated to the precept, the maximizing individual potential will build a just and viable society. The National Archives preserves historic documents affirming America's core commitment to ethical behavior and human equality. The McGowan Fund supports community-based providers that buffer those at risk and forge pathways to progress, fostering human dignity. And the McGowan Fund's Fellows Program, now in its sixth year, supports an expanding group of top MBA students committed to ethical leadership. So thank you all for joining us here tonight and thank the moderators and the panelists for contributing their time, expertise to this fascinating program. 
Thank you very much. As you can see, this evening has not been rehearsed. <laughs> it says right here, archivist returns to podium. Okay. <laughs> I'm the archivist. <laughs> now it's my pleasure to welcome to the stage our moderator for the evening, Megan Smith, who will introduce the films. Named in September 2014, Megan is the nation's chief technology officer in the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy. In this role, she serves as an assistant to the president, focused on how technology policy, data, and innovation will affect the nation's future. Her team's priorities include supporting the administration's push for open data and information, advising on a wide range of technology policy issues, and recruiting more top technical talent to serve in government. Before coming to Washington, she served as vice president of new business development at Google, leading the company's acquisitions of major platforms such as Google Earth and Google Maps. Megan is an award-winning entrepreneur, engineer, and tech evangelist with an intense focus, focus on women in technology. As an undergraduate at MIT, she was a member of the student team that designed, built, and raced a solar car 2,000 miles across the Australian outback. A loyal daughter of tech, she has a bachelor's and master's degree in mechanical engineering, completing her master's thesis at the MIT Media Lab, on whose board she has served as well as the MIT Corporation, MIT Technology Review Board also. And a little known fact, I was Megan's librarian when she was a student at <laughs> MIT. <laughs> in her spare time, Megan leads the quest for the original Declaration of Sentiments, written by Elizabeth Cady Stanton and signed by 100 attendees at the Seneca Falls Convention in 1848. Please join me in welcoming Megan Smith. Thank you. Um, I love that we have POTUS, and we have FLOTUS, and VPOTUS, and AOTUS. <laughs> it's cool. Um, actually, uh, we were doing a geography mapping thing, and we had uh, GOTUS, the geographer of the United States. And I noted that POTUS 1 was GOTUS 1, if you can figure that out. Um, it's really great to be with everybody. Uh, the president was just at South by Southwest. Um, and his message there was really, you know, here's a gathering of Americans from all over our country and people around the world who are really, you know, our artists, makers, techie, innovators, coders, thinkers, dreamers, coming together to celebrate and share um, and move things forward, whether it was sort of interactive or film or the music side. And he really, uh, he was, uh, you know, in his best of community organizing. He was really talking to people about how do we all get involved. And especially with the amazing tools that we have of the digital age that connect us so well. And uh, his focus was on really three things. One was um, asking the techies to come serve in government, which is what some of us are doing. You know, just like the Surgeon General uh, comes and rotates, we don't want all doctors in government, but some of them would be fabulous uh, on a regular basis rotating. Same with our, our scientists, and same with our um, you know, amazing lawyers and economists. And really, our government's just us. You know, it's just whoever shows up to be who we will be. And so, you know, asking the digital tech crew to rotate in was what part of his message. And we're starting to do that. We have over 300 people already who've come to serve in the United States Digital Service uh, that the president helped us start. And uh, the President of Digital Innovation Fellows who float around archives has had some of them. They're kind of like entrepreneurs in residence um, who come in. And, uh, and then we've had uh, the 18F team at GSA. So lots of great stuff joining other technical folks and colleagues here. The second thing he was asking, which I think is really part of what tonight is talking about as we think about the shoulders we stand on and where we are in terms of the computer age and what the digital tools have brought us uh, in interconnecting us. And that is, you know, how do we use these amazing tools that we've built and all of us and all of our talent to solve some of the greatest challenges that humanity faces, whether they're you know, climate change and, and issues around the environment, 
or whether they're justice and peace and equality, or whether they're economic inclusion, or whether they're just uh, you know helping your neighbor with something uh, important that they need. And what's so exciting is to watch the sharing economy emerge. You know, and the things that we are starting to share. Of course, it has to do with maybe seats in a car uh, as you're going around the neighborhood, but it's also you know how do we reduce our load on the planet with how we share and how we evolve and how we how we use these technologies. So that I think lives in the spirit of what some of our founders brought us um, in the computer age, and it's gonna be fun to look back. So we're gonna watch some films, and then we're gonna have a panel. So the, the films, there's, there's an expression um, which Churchill said, and he says, the further back you can look, the farther forward you will see. And so it's so important to understand all of our heritage. And sometimes in the telling of stories and our history, we leave people out. Um, I was just uh, watching the Jobs film, and I was lucky in, in my young life, uh, and I came to Silicon Valley, and I got to work on the beginning of these smartphones, and I worked with a team that had worked on the Macintosh computer. And so I was able to see um, the team that actually built the Mac with Steve Jobs, but then when I watched the movies, the women who were in the team aren't in the movies. And it's really debilitating. Because those are amazing people. Now, finally, the most recent movie added one of them, uh, Joanna Hoffman, who Kate Winslet just won the Golden Globe for playing her. But I was watching the beginning of the film, and I, I wrote to Joanna, I'm like, there's these microaggressions and micro, like, sexism all through the lines. One of the ones that stood out the most was, uh, was like, Joanna ironing Steve's shirt in the scene. And, and I said, Joanna, um, you know, I'm watching this. And she wrote, you know, I went to the film with my son, Jeremy. And... Uh, he said, Mom, did you really iron his shirt? And she's uh, from Eastern Europe. She's a physics grad from MIT. She's completely intense. She says, Jeremy, I have never ironed a shirt in my life. <laughs> except, except one time when I had to iron yours, we were really late. <laughs> so these little details, these insidious things. There's a moment in the film where uh, the dynamic tension, some writer is writing something fabulous about like how Steve needs to get the demo working, which was real kinds of things that happen. But then he, he's like talking about how he's going to uh, announce everyone in the team, and so-and-so did this, so-and-so did that, so-and-so did this, um, and I'm not going to talk about you unless you get this done. And at one point during that, he says, Susan designed the bag. And I thought, Susan, he's talking about Susan Care. Susan Care is the, is the woman who designed the face of the Macintosh. Every graphical thing that you see is Susan. And Bill Atkinson was the back end, quick draw. And the two of them working together, she was this amazing artist. And when the Xerox Park team on which the Macintosh is based came to see the Mac, they just, Joanna said they were staring at the screen. They're like, how did you do this? Susan didn't know you can do it with that low of memory, so she just did it. And so from the Macintosh, Susan, uh, Susan created the face of it the love of it, the way it's fun and playful. Uh, so came Windows and the graphical engineer. So came the Mac back. And so came the iPhone and our smartphones. And so the impact is not the bag. The impact is this beautiful design that, that women did. And so we'll jump to these movies. So the first one is called The Computers. And Kathy Kleiman, stand up, is here. She's going to be on stage in a minute. She'll tell you uh, in the movie about it, but it's about the ENIAC programs. How many people in the film, in the, in this, uh, have seen the film uh, Imitation Game? Yeah, lots of people. Okay, so the story of Bletchley Park, the cracking of the uh, Enigma codes uh, to, to uh, break the Nazi codes. Amazing heroic engineering during World War II. This is the American side of that story. The ENIAC, which was at University of Pennsylvania, and the six first digital women uh, first digital programmers, not just women, di digital programmers in our country. Um, a nearly lost, 70-year, uh, nearly lost history story. So we're going to hear, we're going to just see the trailer, um, and it's available uh, on uh, eniacprograms.org to rent, and it's uh, Women Make Movies also if you want to watch the whole thing. The next one we're going to see is Queen of Code. Where's Jillian? So Jillian Jacobs, stand up for a sec so they can see you. So we'll see Jillian's uh, film, Queen of Code. Who's the Queen of Code? Grace Hopper. Grace Hopper, yes. So Grace Hopper, the incredible rear admiral in the Navy. And so we're going to hear her story. Then we're going to hear the story of Katherine Johnson. Uh, Katherine Johnson, uh, amazing, amazing NASA mathematician. 
Um, and uh, the Makers team, I hope you have seen the Makers.com series. It's the largest collection of film about films about women. There's a four minute film about Catherine, who is uh, the American who calculates so many of our first uh, missions in, into space that were so important. We're going to hear about her. Dylan McGee is the filmmaker of that. And I have to tell you, Mike Moore, stand up. Her grandson is here. So I, uh, I was lucky to meet him because Catherine, who was born two years before women got the vote, uh, was in the White House this year receiving the Presidential Medal of Freedom from President Obama for her incredible service to our country. So just amazing. <laughs> She did many things, including she did many things, including taking us to the moon. Um, and then uh, we're going to see code. So we're going to have these three early look, and then we're going to look at code, which is why are the numbers so low for women uh, in in the tech arena? And so Robin Reynolds put together a film. I think we're going to just see the, the trailer of that. And then we'll come up and we'll have a conversation. Telly Whitney here is here from the Nita Borg Institute, Florence Tan from NASA, uh, Emily Reed from Girls Who Code, and we have a late edition of the incredible Zara Wright so that we can have a high school coder on stage with us. So she's going to join us, too. So without further ado, um, we're going to switch to the films. And we'll be back up right after. Thank you. If you're in the computer field, uh, from the very beginning, you're going to be the first in a lot of things I've never since. Uh, never been in as exciting an environment. We knew we were pushing back frontiers. In February of 1946, six months after World War II had ended, America learned of a secret army project called ENIAC. It was the first all-electronic digital computer. Yet the tale of ENIAC's programming by a group of young women has been all but erased from computer history. During World War II, the U.S. had assembled a crew of nearly 100 mathematically trained women whose official title was computer. Women who were computing complex ballistic trajectory equations by hand and using mechanical desktop calculators. In the spring of 1945, six were selected to figure out how to program the ENIAC machine. Fran Bielis, Betty Jean Jennings, Ruth Lichterman, Kathleen McNulty, Betty Schneider, Marlon Westcott. We were computing ballistic tables on a hand calculator. We were computing, and we were computers. There were logical diagrams of the ENIAC, and we were supposed to study them to figure out how to program it. The ENIAC was a son of a bitch to program. ENIAC became a legend. Eckhart and Mockley became famous. However, the ENIAC programmer story the story of these six women founders who created the first sort routine, first software application, and became the first teachers of modern programming was never told. Their work dramatically altered computing in the 1940s and 1950s as they paved the path to modern computer science. At that time, the emphasis was on the invention of the ENIAC, I mean, developing the mechanics, the hardware. We were like fighter pilots. I mean, here was this great, great machine, but you couldn't just take any ordinary pilot and stick him into a fighter pilot and say, go to it now, man. I mean, that was <laughs> not the way it was going to be. I had a fantastic life. Everything I did was the beginning of something new. I really loved working with those girls. There will be 1.4 million jobs by 2020 in the computing-related field. Less than 29% of them are going to be filled by Americans, and less than 3% of that 29% are going to be women. I don't think software engineering is a meritocracy. Being excellent or being good at your job isn't enough if you're a woman in tech. The sort of phenomenon of the programmer has really interested me. Programmer. 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 It's hard to encourage more women to come into an environment that will sexually harass them and not fund them. As soon as a woman gets introduced, it's like blood in the water. When companies started putting these full diversity disclosure reports out there, it became very obvious, wow, there really is a problem. This is something that we need to be trying to address. 
Women were the pioneer programmers. They've been written out of history, unfortunately. Grace Hopper came up with the concept of real programming languages. Ha, <laughs> coding's magic. I like coding because instead of us being consumers, we could be like a producer. In the same way that everyone should know a little bit about law and everyone should know a little bit about economics, you probably should know a little bit about computer science. Growing up, I was actually a, a system kid. I didn't know that I could learn how to code like so quickly. The reason that there's a gap is actually related to some really real structural factors. Girls aren't encouraged to pursue computer science. They're overlooked because, you know, it's the boys that are good at science and it's the boys that are taking apart computers at age nine. Most students have no exposure to programming. Computer science should be a requirement in all public schools. This is a Rosie the Riveter moment because the jobs are here and we don't have the workers to fill them. For the digital revolution to truly be great, it can't just be for a certain set of people. I'm hopeful because I think that the tech industry could move the fastest. If we see the problem, we can debug it. This is our country, our cities, our communities, our children, our code. Code. Debugging the gender gap. Mm. Aren't they awesome? Yes. So we're going to um, pull everyone up. Uh, all right, so um, I'm going to stay. We're, we're going to bounce around. Uh, we wanted to have a, a mix of both some of our incredible filmmakers who know some of these stories, also some of the women who are working in computer science and some of those who are coming to join computer science. So I'm going to turn actually first to, to Kathy um, because uh, Talk about the photos and what happened when you found this story. And it, it's such an amazing thing because, um, you know, Catherine, uh, Michael's grandmother, I randomly, somebody saw her picture on a web page and sent it to me and I sent it to Dylan who does Makers and we're like, run with your camera and make this <laughs> film and tell us if this is a true story. I mean, how incredible to have that moment with your grandmother. And she's looking at Neil Armstrong mm -hmm. and saying, hoping he's got it right. And I'm hoping I have it right, too. <laughs> <laughs> just amazing. And the president was like, how good must she have been? You know, when he gave, you know, just thinking about how talented, you know, she is. And so thank you for being here tonight. So, and in that same way, Kathy, talk a little bit about the, this discovery you made. And, and you were in college. Sure. Um, I speak now in front of a lot of college students. And I always tell them, be careful what pictures you pick up. Mm -hmm. Uh, because you might be working on them years later. So I was taking a lot of computer science courses in the mid-80s, and in the lower level of courses, there were a number of women. But as you got to the upper level, sometimes there was another woman, sometimes there were no women. And so I began to wonder if women were involved in computing. And so, of course, I knew about Ada Lovelace, and I knew about Grace Hopper. Um, but one, Ada Lovelace was in the 19th century, Grace Hopper was in the 20th century, and one woman a century didn't make me feel warm and fuzzy about the field of computing. <laughs> so I wound up finding these pictures of ENIAC. These are pictures taken in 1946. ENIAC was made public um, in February of 46, after the war had ended. It's really unfortunate that in the UK they destroyed the machines at Bletchley Park. But in the US, we decided to publicize them. Um, which was a really good thing, um, because this was, uh, ENIAC was the first all electronic, general purpose programmable computer. And um, in these pictures that were taken, they're very formal pictures, they're very beautiful. Um, and they show, you know, you, you saw them, they, they show how big the ENIAC was. It was eight feet tall, 80 feet long, took up three sides of a big room. And the purpose of the picture was to show that it dwarfed the people. Um, but what got me was that there were men and women in the pictures. And the men were in the captions, the women weren't. And I went and I asked my professor at Harvard, you know, who are the women in the pictures? And he sent me to a co-founder of the Computer History Museum, and she said they're models, and that I should really stop asking silly questions. So 40 years after their work, they were models. When I found out they weren't, um, I decided, I knew nothing about videography, I knew nothing about production, but I decided we had to tape them telling their stories. And that's yeah, what we so did. Yeah, you, and so you found them, and you began to pull the story out of them, and it's an astonishing story. Uh, just the details, and I encourage everyone to, to watch the whole film. But just say a little bit, your son is here. Um, you were working on looking at the patents and talking to them. Say a little bit about that story. So um, it did take a while to kind of 
it turns out programming hasn't changed all that much, but how you interface with the computer has changed a lot. So it took a long time to kind of learn how to ask the right questions to get the right answers. But one of the things they did show us were the patent diagrams, the wiring diagrams. Where's my son Sam? He spent some time with, with uh, Jean Bardock herself, and uh, she, she shared the patent diagrams and, and explained the different pieces, because the different pieces of ENIAC, there were 40 panels, and each panel had kind of a dedicated purpose, and she made a special scrapbook for Sam, and you, which you he were reminded about, me of. How old were you at the time? You were like five, maybe, or six, maybe? Yeah. Well, he was a little older by then, but when he was five, and we have to tell the story of Sam now. Um, <laughs> when he was five, he, he had met um, Kay Mockley-Antonelli, he had met Jean Bardock, he had met Betty Holberton, and he, he knew about the work, and he came up to me and he's like, he was really, really worried, and he came up and said, Mom, can boys be programmers too? <laughs> <laughs> and now I should say he's in computer science in high school, so. Um, which was a great story, but she passed on materials to him, which he reminded me of when we were filming the documentary. And when I was trying to find materials that said they had learned it from the wiring diagrams and the block diagrams, he reminded me of the notebook Jean had made for him, and we, we wound up using that material. I'd also like to point out we, we have a, a pioneer in our audience, um, Dr. Yay. Jean Samet. Jean, could you just wave? wave you don't have to get up. Yay. Thank you for letting me introduce you. You heard a lot about COBOL in the, in the documentary. Jean was on the original COBOL committee, creating that language that is now, you know, has billions of lines of code out. Um, she was the first female president of the Association of Computing Machinery. She was at IBM for at least two decades, maybe three, and just pivotal in the creation of many programming languages and wrote the book, The History of Programming Languages. So if you want to meet a genuine computer pioneer, uh, please come and say hi to Jean afterwards. So. Terrific. So thank you for being here and for your leadership in our industry. Awesome. So, um, okay, so Kathy found this story. Gillian, yeah. talk a little bit about the Queen yeah. of Code. I love the moment that you have. I never really knew sort of exactly how, you know, how dismissive people were about her, the idea of languages and getting to there. So it's really wonderful to see you capture that. Yeah, I um, know nothing about computers. I have no technical background. Um, I uh, was on a television show and some of my cast members had started to direct uh, ESPN 30 for 30 sports documentaries. And I met the producer, Dan Silver, and I said, if you're giving directing jobs to actors with no experience, put me on the list. <laughs> um, and uh, out of the blue, months later, he called me and said, uh, ESPN's acquired this website, 538, we want to do those sorts of documentaries, but about statistics, tech, and, tech and computing, do you want to make one about Grace Hopper? Mm -hmm. And I said, who's Grace Hopper? <laughs> um, and really, I began a journey from knowing nothing to speaking with people who told me not only about Grace, but about the women of ENIAC. I went to the Grace Hopper celebration, interviewed Kelly, mm -hmm. basically dragged both of you into my documentary. <laughs> uh, <laughs> And um, it really sparked such a genuine curiosity, excitement. I will call myself out. I burst into tears when I realized that I met Jean because I read about you sitting in my living room. And so stupid. But, um. <laughs> it's, but this is such, it's such an amazing thing that, uh, you know, one of the key things that helps bring people into a field is knowing that people like you have been part of it. And, and it's so fundamental. You know, to, to these, that these stories are lost are really a problem for our future. And so it's part of the key of all this. To so silly of me to cry, but um, I looked up like every woman, because I looked up every woman, you know, that I could find that was involved in the computing industry in the 1950s. So to realize that was you that I was reading about, it's just moving. And um, Kathy is incredible, and you're amazing, and I'm going to stop talking. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay, so um, I'm going to go to now what you guys are doing. So talk uh, Emily, a little bit about um, Girls Who Code is amazing. You guys are in multiple states. You're working and pulling in incredible people. Um, so why don't you guys talk a little bit about, first talk about Girls Who Code, and then we'll jump in. Sure. So Girls Who Code is a national nonprofit trying to close the gender gap in computer science by teaching middle and high school girls. Um, we have two programs, our summer immersion program, um, which is now in 12 cities, and we've had 
some really amazing success with that program. That was how Zara first got involved. She was in our summer immersion program uh, our first year in DC last year. And um, Zara, you're a junior now, right? Yeah, I said, yeah. Great, and uh, and you are you have not taken computer science except for they pulled you into last summer, so right? Yeah. Well, actually, I've taken a few. A few, classes. okay. <laughs> this is like the first real immersion program that Got I've it. been in. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, and so we have most of our students come in with either some experience like Zara had or no experience um, coming into the program, um, and they leave and they can write in Python and JavaScript and they can build apps and they can build video games and they can really learn how, as I think was mentioned in Queen of Code to learn how to be creators of, of technology and not just users of it. Um, we found with the Summer Immersion Program that we've 90% uh, of our alumni are majoring or minoring in computer science in college. Um, and the most important part of that is that 75% of them had a different intended path before mm -hmm. Girls Who Code. So we're really trying to fill that pipeline um, with girls who will be amazing at computer science and just haven't had the opportunity yet. So, so thank you. Zara, can you talk a little bit about your experience? So Zara Wright, is, uh, she's a junior, and you're at a really cool school, School Without Walls. Yeah. Uh, so a wonderful school here in DC. Talk a little bit about your experience and what you're thinking, and, and what, what it feels like to see some of these films. Did you know some of these stories? Did you not? Um, well, my mom is the reason that I'm into computer science right now. She knew that it was important, so she's gotten me into little camps and things. And when she found out about Girls Who Code, I think, um, when she found out, I think it was like 2012, um, it hadn't been in DC yet, and when she found out I was coming to DC, she was like, Zara, you gotta go here, you know? <laughs> go I was like, girls who code, I don't know, you know, I'll look at it, and um, you know, she made me apply. I'm very happy that she did, thank you, Mom. Um, Thanks, Mom. <laughs> Mom. Yeah. Your mom. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but she made me apply. Um, I had the most wonderful summer experience. I made lots of friends. Um, and not only did I learn how to code and program, but there's definitely like a leadership portion that you get to learn and you get to meet role models and you get to meet women, um, all types of women, um, different careers. And you just, um, you know, when you see somebody that looks like you doing something that you think is impossible, it, um, really opens up doors, you know? It makes me like passionate about a career that I normally wouldn't have thought about, so. Yeah. It's, it's an amazing thing, so. <laughs> so I wanna turn to Florence and Telly. So Florence is an incredible leader at NASA. Probably one, I don't know how many people have things near Saturn right now. So can you talk a little bit about, about that work and how you came into this and, and uh, a little bit of that? Okay. Um, I actually am from Malaysia. I was uh, born and bred there. And um, I want to tell you about my high school experience <laughs> and, and how I came here. Um, I uh, was uh, going to come to college. And when I was applying for school, I was good at math. and. I wanted to be an aeronautical engineer because I watched Star Trek. And <laughs> yeah. so I was fascinated by space. And the guy uh, who was the counselor said, well, you're a girl. You know, maybe you should be an accountant. Good math. Mm -hmm. And I said, no, I really want to do engineering. And so then, but he's like, aeronautical, nah. So then I said, at the time, there was no gender. Uh, assignment in Malaysia for computer science yet. Because it was, you know, my sister went to computer science, we were 50-50. So I said, how about computer science? And he said, okay. So when I came here, I switched my major to computer engineering, because it's <laughs> related. So I got to go to engineering. And um, what was interesting was um, uh, being, you know, networking is so important. I, I Met, I just have, I'm very lucky, I met a friend who was working at NASA, and he, she said, why don't you come here and work uh, as an intern? So I said, okay. So <laughs> I interviewed, and the guy wanted to test me, so he said, oh, you've taken electromagnetic theory. Derive Maxwell's equations. That's an equation about light and how it, you know, and God, and then God, God uh, says, you know, let there be light, that kind of thing. Well, there's, <laughs> there's <laughs> physics behind it. So anyway, I derived Maxwell's <laughs> equations, and I got the job. Nice. So it turns out that you have to be 
uh, when, when a door opens, you kind of have to be prepared. You know, you can't just say, oh boy, I got this connection, I can come in. You, you've got to work at it. It's, and so through that uh, connection, the one connection that was so pivotal, I didn't know when I said hi to this girl next to me in physics that I would get to work on uh, Cassini, the Cassini mission, which is, um, uh, uh, go, was going to Saturn, and I was flabbergasted that NASA was going to spend, at the time, uh, quite, you know, $3.4 billion now, um, to go to, you know, they were sending this orbiter around Saturn, and then one to go into Titan, which is the moon of, of Saturn. And this thing was going to take seven and a half years to get to Saturn, and it was going to be dropped for 60 minutes into Titan and then crash land, and that was it. That was my job, to build the computer and write the software to do this, this job, and also do the orbiter too. There's another computer on the orbiter. So I said, oh my God, I'm gonna fail. I, I'm just, I'm not gonna do well because this is too hard. I was in my 20s, early 20s when this happened. And um, I, um, I, I worked really hard. So it turns out you have to work hard and test, and test, and retest, make sure the code, because there's no repairability in space. You can't just say, oh boy, we'll just have a recall. There's no <laughs> recall. <laughs> so you got to work it and you got to test and come. In, the, in NASA, there's thing, something called root cause. You have to understand root cause. And being able to understand root cause gives you the confidence that your hardware and your software will work. And that's what I learned. You know, it's, it's uh, being prepared, learning about uh, the, the environment and then working really hard in testing. And there's no shortcuts to success, I, I believe. You, you kind of just really have to work at it. At least that has been my experience. Yeah, so now the, so the orbiter is still orbiting around Saturn. Wow. Yeah. 20 years later, and we have, my hardware is still working and my software is still working. So, good. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't fail. So there, that's the it's story. It's amazing, you know, in NASA, there have been so many women involved in NASA. Yeah. And uh, one of the ones that uh, I came across that some people have known, Margaret Hamilton. Um, there's a photo on the internet, I encourage you to go look up Margaret Hamilton. She's standing next to this pile of papers that are just taller than her, just slightly. And uh, it's the code for the lunar lander, which she wrote and managed. Uh, and, and in fact, there's a moment apparently in, in NASA where uh, the lander was landing, and because of the way she architected this, um, even though some switches were mis mis switched, mis -flipped, mis -flipped, um, it stayed on it stayed on the landing sequence, or it might have left. Mm -hmm. So just uh, you know, just the architecture and the thinking and the confidence and the amazing work that you guys do. So congratulations and thank you, um, Kelly. You know, we're one of the things that's in amazing about Anita Borg Institute and Anita Borg's original work was noting how much impact these technologies have on everything we do in every part of society and how it was so critical that, uh, that we, women, people of color, everybody on the planet, men and women, be working together on our future. Um, and so talk a little bit about some of the things you guys are working on. Uh, Telly and I talk a lot about not admiring the problem so much. We have a problem that we're gender imbalanced, we're racially imbalanced in tech and in these areas, and we gotta fix it. And the good news is people like you guys, you know, are working hard to solve it. And some of our organizations like NASA, you guys are making films to pull us up. And you guys, you have a lot of things that you have found. So maybe talk a little bit about the tough side of the numbers, but what we're finding. Sure. And I will say that I'm a computer scientist, and when I first, my first programming class um, was COBOL, was on CART, and was taught by a woman. There was actually, um, <laughs> this was the 80s, and there were quite a few women around. It was um, about 40% women. It was in about 40%. And we, we just went off a cliff we did. with the beginning of the personal computer because we just thought culturally it was for the boys. That's and so right. So we just lost yeah. it. So in the early 80s, they, they were around. There was quite a few of them around. Um, I, so I worked in computer science. I worked in the semiconductor industry for many years, but took over the Niederborg Institute. We're a nonprofit. We work with women, providing connections, inspiration, and guidance. Our best known program is the Grace Hopper Celebration, which you have, were introduced in the films. Um, we had, the first one, we had 500 women 
1994, and we had 12,000 women in October. I mean, it's, and if for those women who work in the field and feel like they're the only one to come into a room with that many women is just, um, it's life changing. I mean, one of the great things about my job is that I have these young women who come up and, and, um, and really explain how, I mean, the author in tears, um, how this changed their life. And they really thought that they were alone. And if they had known that there were so many women working in the field, um, they might have done it differently. So it's, a, it's, a, it's an extraordinary experience. We also work with organizations. Um, you know, it's great to work with women, um, but one by one, if you get you attract them to the field. But if you don't have organizations where women thrive, then it's really a lost cause. So a lot of our work is in working with organizations. Many companies have um, to, to to provide cultures and to first understand your numbers and how to create change. Right now, it's about 18 percent of computer science grads are women overall. From the research universities, it's closer to 12 percent. Um, so the numbers are still stunningly low. Um, but one of the tough parts is that women leave at twice the rate of men when they do get into the, uh, into the company. So because they don't feel like they belong, I mean, that's sort of the downside, as Megan was talking about. But what I do know is that there are companies that are creating a lot of change. I mean. One example is uh, Intel, who, um, I mean, I come from Semiconductor. This is, Intel is a chip company, and it's a very male kind of in environment, but they have um, looked at their numbers. They understand that each at each point where they're losing women and creating programs to help them stay. Last year, they increased the percentage of women within their work rank by 2%, a little less than 2%, which may not seem like a lot to you, but when you're talking about tens of thousands of numbers, it's actually unheard of. I mean, in one year to make that kind of change is unheard of. And it's really by the, this accountability, looking at your numbers and creating change. Um, so I see it's really important to do both. It's to, for, for organizations to make the commitment to, to change. And what I do know is that these are the organizations that will thrive in the next 50 years because, um, I mean, 50%, there's, there's, a, there's just not enough digital um, expertise to go around. And the ones that can attract half the population are going to be the ones that, that are successful. Yeah, we did, uh, the president hosted the first ever White House Demo Day. Mm -hmm. And so we had uh, 90 entrepreneurs from 30 different companies all across mm -hmm. the White House. It was awesome, like a science fair. Um, and celebrating uh, uh, all the entrepreneurship. And, and uh, it was great to see the companies like Intel and others stepping up to commitments. For example, the Rooney-Murray rule, which is where you commit to hiring a diverse, uh, looking at a diverse slate yes, as right, you're making hires. Exactly. So Xerox and Microsoft and Pinterest and others were signing up for that. Um, we saw the venture capital community, which is really, uh, uh, Tough really community. a trouble area because mm -hmm. we only see 3% uh, of venture money going to women, mm -hmm. less than 1% to African-American founders. And so right now, for example, in the economic downturn, a large number of, of Hispanic women founded incredible companies. They're not getting the growth capital that mm -hmm. they need. We need that set of entrepreneurs to do that because that's the next jobs for everybody. Mm -hmm. So you know, working on that, the good news is during the demo day, um, 40, 42 different venture capital firms signed up to working on not only their own partnership and mm -hmm. the diversity within the partnership, but also their funding. And we're also seeing new sets of funders coming in. So some work starting in that area, which is so critical mm -hmm. to change. But it's, it's a culture shift, and there's sort of the work with the young people mm -hmm. and uh, the computer science for all work that the president's working on to try to get coding into all of our classrooms, K-12, whether it's you know pure coding like a class or it might be uh, data science, where we get to work on some of the amazing programs NASA. NASA has both looks out and looks down, right? So there's data science work there. So really yeah. working on all those pieces, yeah. One of the things that we're doing is something called the Top uh, Company Leadership Index, where companies can submit their numbers in a confidential way and look at their numbers. And just being able to, to assess where you are and how you compare to your peers, I mean, there's a, always huge competition between companies can make a huge difference.
Right. There's a lot of work also in the area of unconscious bias. We've seen mm -hmm. great changes in bias over these years, but we've seen almost no change in the last 30 years in mm -hmm. unconscious bias. Mm -hmm. It's also extraordinary institutional bias, and so a lot of companies are doing uh, training in those things. Um, yeah. So I have, I, I, you know, like to be skeptical about all the numbers, and pardon me if, but here's what I think, right? You kind of have to increase the supply. You know, you, you have you have only 17%, 17.6, you know, engineering, I know computer science, you just said it. And you're trying to make your population of uh, workers in any company, and if you get 17% uh, women in that company, you've basically gotten all the supply that's there. So it seems to me that one has to increase the supply uh, by working at from from the you know ground up you know people like Zara and I think that one of the things um, I I go and I volunteer in schools and for example I, I took a, I work on the Curiosity rover as well and and I took the rover on a, a field trip and I went to a local school <laughs> and you know the kids got to sign up this is career fair and there were two girls out of thirty that signed up to to listen. And it was, it was really, I, I tr I'm very engaging. I try and you know, tell the kids <laughs> only the fun stuff, none of the work and all the fun, right? You kind of have to track them whichever way you can. So, so I, I tell them, oh, this is, you know, look at how cool this is. I show them the picture of the lander. I don't know if any of you have seen the picture of how we landed on Mars with the sky crane. You come in with a, yeah, with a capsule, it opens up. It's like, star, you know, it's like Star Trek, really. And, <laughs> and, and you come down on a, on a, on a tethered uh, sky crane, a rocket, and you, you gently, la gently land the rover and you cut the tether, the, the sky crane flies away, and then the rover starts roving. So it's pretty cool. If you haven't, has, have you haven't, haven't seen it, seven, seven minutes of terror, awesome. JPL. Go, yeah. go, go look at Google, seven minutes of terror. And, 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 <laughs> and, 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 okay, there's a reason why it's seven minutes of terror. Because and you guys were watching while it had already happened. Oh, yeah, happened, yeah, yeah. Right? It was, it was, it was, right? Okay, the problem is it, it takes seven, it takes 14 minutes for the data from the surface to get to our, you know, uh, deep space network uh, and, and get to us. But the, 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 the moment the rover touches the top of, I mean, the, the, the capsule touches the top of Mars and landing down onto the surface, that's only seven seven minutes. So when, by the time you get information that you, you know, you've gone to the top of Mars, you landed. You've been there seven minutes, you've crashed, you've landed, however. So, so we, we were very tense. So I went to the school and I tried to tell these kids you know, how cool it is to work in a computer. And there's such a dearth of girls. And there is, I go to middle school and I go to high schools, and I go to um, elementary schools, and there's this drop off. Yeah, so and it's, I don't it's know a how real to challenge, and, and it has to do with uh, discouraging, discouraging mm -hmm. girls. It's also in the media, so not only is the history lost, but also uh, Gina Davis's institute does such, such terrific work counting uh, the professions, and out of every four characters on children and family television, only one's a girl. In STEM fields that are shown in our cartoons and our active shows for, for children and family, out of five characters, only one's a girl. And sadly, for computer science, on television for our children, it's 15 to 1, boy programmers to girl programmers that are shown to them. It's hard because the unconscious bias of our incredible Hollywood colleagues who are making this beautiful you know, media for the kids, uh, they just, they're just thinking, oh, a programmer, and they just cast or they animate a boy. And so we really have to change that. Yeah. Oh, oh go. Um, one of, I mean, talking about things that work, though, there's some very interesting work at universities where they start out with low percentage of women in, in computer science, but some of them have, like Harvey Mudd School in particular in Claremont, California, is up to almost 50% of their computer science. By changing the grade. curriculum. By changing the curriculum, but also being able to move between majors in that freshman year is really important because the kids get so turned off before they get to the school. Yeah, so it's, it, if you can get people to start to try it and yes. experience what it yes. is and know their heroes, yes. you can change that. Yeah, Kath. And I was thinking, it's not just it's not just the media. I went to I, I've been in the middle school career fairs because my kids went through there, and you know you go in and they have different careers in different places. So education's in one area and sciences are another area. And the technology row was all male except for me. 
I mean, that's a, that's a clear message that's being sent about who goes into, who should be going into those careers, and we've got to change that. Yeah, we have 600,000 jobs up in the United States in the area of tech, and so they pay 50% more than the average American salary, mm -hmm. and yet um, people are not being, so it's a supply and demand problem of uh, like a culture clash. The good news is there's programming stuff working in the beginnings for young people, and we need to get really diligent about um, working on our media and all of our programs and our bias. At the, at, for grown-ups, we have things like Tech Hire, which President started, so this code boot camps have come, so anybody, and we were just, uh, I mentioned those early stories about Joanna Hoffman, who was uh, in the Mac team. Uh, she said that Debbie Coleman was the head of manufacturing. He said, mm -hmm. for everybody who has an English degree, Debbie had an English degree and she became the manufacturing lead for Macintosh, so anybody <laughs> wants to come into some of those open jobs from any field, Using these code boot camps or other things, there's short pathways in, and there's about 50 cities already doing this with hundreds of employers looking at alternative hiring. So I'm going to open up uh, for a couple questions because we we have uh, a little bit more time together. So uh, are there any questions out there? Microphones, microphones are now. Can we pass them, or should people get up? Or so there's uh, there's some microphones here and here. People want to kind of hop up. I saw a couple hands go up. So there's one coming over. Get mm -hmm. requested from Doug. Well, these are guys are coming up. Yeah, go oh, ahead. I was just going to say, um, Kathy, I love that you mentioned the the kind of the stereotypes, right? Um, and I think a large part of what we try to do is show that, like, you can combine. There's sort of the stereotype of, like, again, the programmer or the guy in his basement who only cares about computer science. And one of the things that we do with the girls, and we really find this, you know, we have there are people who have diverse interests outside of computer science, and we kind of show how you can use. You know, computer science to to explore that even further. So we do a lot with like computer graphics, combining like art and computer science, and show girls that like actually when we were calling Zara to see if she could come, she was at lacrosse practice. I think, yeah. Right? Yeah. Like so, these girls have like so much that they want to do, and computer science is a part of that. Um, so we're really just trying to to change that stereotype to say like you can be a computer scientist and still be yourself. Yeah, it's not video games, it's not just one or two things, it's a whole breadth of thing. everything, including data science. Yeah, I just wanted to add, my school is about two thirds female. And in my AP physics class, there are about five of us out of 20. And I just thought that it's crazy, the disparity. <laughs> yeah. I mean, um, you know, in my AP bio class, what, 19 out of 21 people are female, mm -hmm. but then in AP mm -hmm. physics, yeah. Five out of 20. And it doesn't make any sense. And in fact, uh, uh, in the gravity wave discoveries, uh, there are some incredible women deeply involved in that. Uh, I was thinking a little bit about it because um, I, w I had the honor to work a little bit with Malala Yousafzai, uh, who uh, is fighting for education all around the world. And she, um, most people don't know that her favorite subject is physics. Uh, and uh, and I was thinking, there's this amazing woman who's an immigrant from Pakistan who's on the gravity waves discovery team <laughs> at MIT and, and Caltech, just incredible. And that you know this path of that hero, you know Einstein's, uh, you know perception that that was there, discovery that there, and that we found it, and it was a connection through Pakistan and a hero for Malala, mm -hmm. you know, and a hero for all of us. And why does physics and why does computer science stay prototype? It's really interesting. Yeah, we'll go here and then there. Yes. ago and 40 kids got scholarships for the first time there were more girls than boys wow. <laughs> so Florence there's hope but I just wanted to ask Telly what do you think what is Intel doing right and what can other companies be doing to catch up um, so the point with Intel is that they're they take accountability seriously so yeah. they know their numbers they are doing they're debugging where they're losing women and then they're putting programs in place to look at those changes. And things like the top company is something they use. What I see is some companies get caught up in activities. So they create all these activities without really truly understanding if they make a difference. Yeah, it's, it's interesting because it's really coming from the CEO yeah. and from the leadership of Intel. Mm -hmm. And uh, every company, of course, has diversity in, it, in its priorities. But it's when they move it to the top three, mm -hmm. instead of keeping it in the top 20, mm -hmm. that you start to see a real shift in the culture. 
And also, you know, instead of having the meeting on diversity keep slipping on the executive's calendar, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and the product shipping is not missing, <laughs> moving, but this is. And, and you see that the companies like Intel and IBM and others are, Microsoft, others are starting to really pay attention at that yeah. level. Yeah. Hi, um, you mentioned those coding boot camps. What are your thoughts on those? And they're just really short and they kind of throw you into this different career. Um, I don't know if they really prepare you for them, but I've heard a lot about them. And I was kind of inter interested in going to one, so I just want to hear a little bit more about your thoughts on yeah, those. Yeah, I think we, you, we should, uh, do you want to take that one and I'll talk a little more? Yeah. Sure, so um, I think it's really, I think we'll see because it's, it's really a new phenomenon. Um, one of the things that we really try to focus on in our program is comp the idea of computational thinking. So the idea being that the student should really understand base computational concepts like loops and conditionals and eventually objects and functions more than a specific programming language. So more than every single library in Python, for example. Um, and the reason why we focus on that is that we know programming languages are constantly going to change. And so we want our students to be able to be prepared and we find that when students really understand that deeply, then they can learn a new language much more easily. So for example, we don't teach Ruby on Rails, but I want a student who leaves the program to be able to say, well, I didn't learn Rails, but maybe I, like, I know enough that I could go and create a Rails app myself. Um, that, I think the only concern I have about coding boot camps is whether that's, like, people who have been through those programs will then be prepared for those changes. I've seen, like, I've had a lot of friends who've gone through them and felt really well prepared to go into a specific engineering job and gotten great jobs at companies like Etsy and Uber and all these really cool companies. Um, I think because they're so new, we'll kind of see what happens, whether people feel, still feel prepared by that experience or whether they're gonna need additional training. One of the things we've been seeing is that sometimes are, people are using that for a fast track to get started and get in. Uh, some of the strong companies are setting up uh, kind of a mentor. Most companies set up a mentor when you get into their company or a buddy system, and that's especially important for those who are coming from the boot camps because they're learning. Some of the boot camps are doing what you're talking about, which is where not only are they taking uh, hard coding skills, they're also teaching soft skills. Some, sometimes people haven't been in the culture of this kind of environment, so talking about you know, how, do you, how do you interact in a design review um, or you know, a, a quest in for interviews, et cetera. And the third area was actually how do you learn? How do you learn best? So because they say this language we're teaching you, it's gonna be a little rusty in a bunch of years. So <laughs> how do we keep you on a track of learning? So I think shop around for the different boot camps and see which ones are interesting to you. But we're definitely seeing huge uh, progress from them and an openness now from the companies there. They're so starving for people from this area that in addition to every four year and two year degree they, uh, person that they can hire, they're gonna grab folks out of these boot camps and maybe it's a mix of them. So we would never wanna discourage four year and two year degrees more of that, but this is a quick track. And uh, if you go whitehouse.gov slash tech hire, there's a lot of information about okay. code boot camps. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. Hi, good evening. I, I want to say first, ladies, you inspire me. Mm -hmm. um, very much so. I, 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 I'm a professional communicator by trade, so I've worked in PR and in corporate communications, in technology and now in government. And words matter. Um, and, and words really matter and, and could be part of what's creating this gender gap. I mean, as, as I've been sitting listening to all this talk about cons computer science tonight, I realized I don't even know what computer science is. Mm -hmm. And I've worked in technology. You know, so, so what does that mean? Does that mean that I can design a computer? Does that mean I can program a computer? Does that mean something else entirely? That I can think in systems thinking? Well, I don't know. And, and I'm gonna be looking into that after tonight. <laughs> but <laughs> this, this could be part of the problem with, with the gender gap. You know, we, we use this abstract language. We talk about these abstract com concepts. The same problem with physics, man. I took physics in high school. I thought some of it was really cool. I thought some of it was really obtuse. I could do the math, I could hang with it. But I couldn't get my head around what we would use it for. And, and so I think that's a problem that, that women have in connecting with some of this stuff. We, we, we're wired to connect with people. We're wired to, to connect with tangible things. And I'm not saying that men aren't, they are. But women seem to, to want some sort of more concreteness with some of these abstract concepts. And, and when you go into a classroom and you talk about like in a physics class, I remember looking at the wave tanks, very cool stuff, doing the equations, very interesting. I went up to Carter Rock, the, the Naval Surface Warfare Center there, I saw the wave tanks and I saw what they use them for to design ship hulls that, that we could go out and, and use in our Navy. 
well, all of a sudden, cha-ching. Man, if I'd have seen that in high school and made that connection, I might have been a physicist. Yeah, <laughs> you know? this is a really important point. You know, a lot of the work on next-gen high schools and the kind of high schools are that you're going to, how do we help our kids be part of the world that we're in? and uh, really work on the hardest problems in class. So the Angry Birds came to a hackathon, and they were uh, working on next-gen schools, and they had an idea. What if we had billion-dollar school? And we're like, okay, what's billion-dollar school? They said, you just walk into school, maybe third grade, and your teachers would say, okay, forget this, you know, all these subjects that are all divided up. We're just going to work on a problem. In fact, this year we're going to work on clean and dirty water, a billion-dollar problem in the world. Mm -hmm. And so, of course, you'd have to learn a little biology, a little mm -hmm. bit of, you know, geography, a little bit of human behavior, a little bit of history, a little bit of English in order to solve that problem, but it changes the orientation. It takes you to the wave tank at the Navy Yard. Yep. Um, and so exactly. how do we help our kids? You know, they're so bored or intimidated by STEM in the way we teach, but we could teach more like we teach art and music, you know, and make it much more fun. One of the things we do at Girls Who Code at the end of the summer is the students do a final project. Um, and everything is project-based for exactly that reason. We want students to be able to really see the real impact of what they're doing. So I asked Zara if she could talk a little bit about her final project. Sure, yeah. So before I attended Girls Who Code, me and my friends, we went to King's Dominion and I got lost. I didn't want to go <laughs> on one of those roller coasters. So I said, you know what, I'll wait for you guys. Um, and then I went to go check something out, and then I realized my phone died. I had no way to get in contact with them. <laughs> so I was lost for about two hours just wandering around Kings of Mini looking for my friends. And so for my final project, um, I wanted to make an app called Find Me <laughs> so that you could connect with your friends. And even if your phone were to die, it would alert your friends um, um, your position or your location or something like that. And actually, I thought it was interesting, iPhone just came out with um, Find Me, and that's now like required on all iPhones. Um, <laughs> you can't delete the app. So I was like, hey, I thought of that. Maybe I've been <laughs> <laughs> you know, That could be my app. So, you know. Um, another, yeah. uh, something we were discussing actually before the event, another issue I've heard people talk about is that girls and women hold themselves to a higher academic standard than men that women feel like they have to be at the top of their class to pursue their major or continue in the field, whether men seem to be more comfortable being mediocre and still pursuing it as a profession. <laughs> <laughs> and so it's that, I think that's part of the reason you see girls leaving the major and then girls also leaving the, the workforce at such a higher rate is that we hold ourselves to the standard of perfection because we probably innately feel like we don't belong in yeah, the room. Yeah, there's a lot of different pieces of that. And Kelly, you should talk a little more. Um, one of the things that, so we talked a little bit about the Declaration of Sentiments, this document that, mm -hmm. I'm off, that we're looking together for uh, from Seneca Falls. But if you read it, it's, it's one of the more, most comprehensive documents, again, about, about women's rights. It was ratified at Seneca Falls, the first women's rights convention. And reading it, it talks, of course, about equal pay, and it talks about um, all sorts of rights that we're trying to get. But the very last one that it mentions is the destruction of confidence. And I think that it speaks to us from the mid-1800s of confidence. And uh, women will apply for a job if they have on average of, of 10 characteristics, if they have on average seven of them. Men will apply if they have three. And it's, it's, mm -hmm. not, it's just a difference in maybe how we're socialized or how, whatever that is, it's real. And uh, we have to deal accordingly. So the Intels and these other companies are working on culture that can say, hey, there's a lot of people qualified for the job. Some might have their hand up, some might not. Let me look broadly and think about you know, how, I'm, how I'm doing this. And let me also encourage people who have clearly had a confidence challenge that's been going on through our culture. So I wanted to talk just a minute about computer science. I'm a computer scientist, so I care passionately about this. And it is programming. It is building the computers. But it's also the, the modeling of how you represent information. And one of the shifts that's happening in our world is that, it, that computer science is becoming ubiquitous. That really all the major problems that we want to solve as we're looking forward, climate change, um, art, um, they all have work hand in hand with computing. I mean, if you want to, much of the great art that's being created are using some form of interacting with a computer. So it's, and that's, that's both a positive and a negative. It means that all of us need to have some skills around computing, but it also means that it's harder to get your hands around what it is. Yeah, very much so. So I wanted to address um, the 
idea of men and women uh, communicating differently. I, I think that I came to this realization um, late. I don't know why, but one of the things that, that I, I would have something fuzzy. You know, math, it, sometimes you're fuzzy, and you, meaning you don't really quite understand the problem. You think you do, but it's just your understanding is licking around the edges. And I, I don't like that feeling. So I always used to wait till the class was over and then mm -hmm. find the teacher and say, you know, I don't understand what you just said. But then I realized, and this is late, that if I asked the question, that there would be others in the class who have the same right. feelings mm -hmm. and that they would be grateful to me mm -hmm. for asking the question. So I think that you know, my saying it in front of all of you, hopefully some, you know, maybe you agree, you know, but I think that helps. And if I can, you know, certainly bring this out to some high school kid or, or even middle school kid, it would be great. You know, yeah. the, the understanding that, that you're not alone, that you should ask questions and that, that don't worry, it's not a shameful thing. It's a, it's a giving it's thing. A, yeah, yeah, you that's should a great reframing. realize this as, you're helping the rest of the class. So we're, we're coming to the close of some of our time, but let's take these, these three last questions. Hello. Um, yeah. Hello, my name is Pleasant. I'm a senior in high school. And um, my question is to all of you, especially Zaria. As a high school student, what can we do just as students to get other women and also other minorities involved into what we do? My school is very small, 500 students and half of it's female. But there's only two females in my AP statistics class. There's only, I think, 10. Well, actually, no, it's three because we have a small senior class that's in our AP Physics and maybe seven that's in our AP Biology, biology class. And it's just sad because they all want to do something major, but there's no space for us and there's something that we can do. What do you think? Well, one, I think the main problem is we're thinking that computer science is an impossible task. Mm -hmm. You know, you hear computer science and just like um, one of the audience members said, what is computer science? People. You know, it's not known, and people think it's just, oh, just a bunch of lines of code, you know, it's hard to do. You have to let your friends know it's not hard. When I talk to my friends, um, they're like, oh, you went to Girls Who Code, you know, what did you do? I was like, I did computer programming. They're like, oh, wow, that's, <laughs> you know, you did all this. I'm like, no, you can do it too. <laughs> it's actually not that hard. Um, you know, I learned, and that's, you know, it's just like any other subject in school, and I think the real issue is that people don't, think it's like that, so. Yeah, it's really important. Um, Matthew McAllister's here who got us a backwards clock for our office. I recommend <laughs> you get one. And uh, I was able to um, give one to Grace, uh, a 10th grader uh, from New Orleans, uh, on behalf of her teaching the police chief there to code as uh, they're working on the police data initiative. Because criminal justice, policing, all of the data science around us is available to us to help us get out of the challenges that we're facing. And so really thinking through whether it's earth science and climate, um, criminal justice, uh, education, uh, find me, you know, these <laughs> things that we should be doing, yeah. Hi, thank you all so much for being here. Um, I understand that the issue of the, the gender disparity in tech is a multifaceted issue. It starts with representation in the media, it starts with you know kids being interested but then slowly dropping out throughout school. And then of course it's compounded by once you get into the tech community that the attrition rate for women is double that of men. Mm -hmm. So I understand that this is a, a problem that has many components and there's not gonna be one cure-all. And with that preface, I would ask what you think the role of different types of organizations are, for example, on this stage, we have nonprofits and we have somebody who, works, who has worked in the media and for NASA and now for the executive branch. But what role should each of these, and, and private institutions, I don't know um, how much the private institutions should be doing versus government and nonprofits and things like that. So I'd be curious on your thoughts. Yeah, sure. Um, on, in the case of the, of the, on the government side, you know, very much the president's push for you know, the commitments and what we needed to do, what we call computer science for all in our K-12 area, the work that we're doing, we were doing in Demo Day around, uh, it's not only things, for example, there's a budget ask in there, there's also the NSF team and uh, National Corporation for Community, uh, Community Service is putting up $135 million. We have a $4 billion budget ask for teacher training. How do we help all our teachers come into this so that when you're all through school, you, they know what computer science is so they can translate that in through data science and app making and music and all those pieces. But it's, it's a real collaboration. It's the, it's the company. It's almost like we call these particular ones all hands on deck. 
because mm -hmm. it's so urgent and it requires our media partners, um, it requires the organizations. The Nita Borg Institute is doing an incredible job across the industry of bringing together the tech leaders and doing best practice work, both in, the, in sort of counting and, and data around it, but also um, the, the work around best practice sharing uh, and debugging it. There's some stuff you should do right away. Uh, and then there's some things that are harder to solve. Yeah. So, so for, for NASA, uh, you know, it's not just go to space. Actually, the mission for NASA is actually educating the public. Yeah. yeah. And and that's why I'm here. You know, that's part of my volunteer. I, I do. I've done about. And NASA is awesome. <laughs> Don't you think? Hey. Yeah. I think so. So so. One of the things that NASA has, uh, NASA has done a lot of uh, public outreach, and, and we are encouraged just, uh, at the, every level to go out and educate and to contribute to, to the public. That's why I have done more than 15 years of you know, career fairs, uh, visiting schools, talking to nursing homes, as well as you know, kids and, and this forum. Um, I think that to answer the, the question of, of what else uh, we can do is, is mentorship. You know, that's, that's, that's something that, just, just to give you guys an idea, right? Um, if you take all the spacecraft, all the stuff that's ever been launched, and you sum the total production of spacecraft, and then you take one, day auto, one day's auto production, that's less than one day's auto production in a year. So, so you know, we, we have, with NASA, it's kind of like a guild. It's not quite, you know, you don't just build hardware and, and not learn from your mistakes. I have a mentor who, who actually has uh, said to me, he has 22,000 pages of notes. Out of that, 20,000 is to address and fix problems that have, he's learned over, over the last 30 years. So the, the point is, you know, there's the, the, the role of NASA is also kind of an archive archival um, of knowledge mm -hmm. that is, we've learned so much, right? In the, in the past, you know, we, we launched something and it got too hot and they put fans on it. It didn't work. Guess what? Why wouldn't it work? There's no air in space. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so, you know, I mean, that's what you, you learn. You will have to learn from your Yeah, mistakes. one of the ones, uh, the first astronaut, one of the first two astronauts who went on EVA, the poor person came back and he was like his entire boots were full of water of yes. sweat. Just he, like a lot. It was so heavy to move in the suit, so they had to redesign the suits. It's just right. amazing. So, so my point is, you know, there's this mentorship part as well to grow your own, as well as to grow to, to disseminate the knowledge to the public and to inspire the next generation. I mean, that, there's a lot of this stuff. So that that's, in my opinion, you know, that mentorship aspect is actually important. And there's also another problem I want to tell you guys about, which alarms me, the aging of the workforce. Mm -hmm. My group, in average. NASA. In NASA. Yeah. It's in NASA's a bunch brand, of like people are retiring, they're falling off, right? Yeah, so let's get, let's yeah. get that. Uh, come join NASA. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe a little bit before, but at the risk of being the only male voice to inject <laughs> into this uh, conversation. Uh, Teachers are the biggest role models that we have growing up. Uh, and they have got to reflect some of the uh, attitudes that we're trying to get across here. My wife and I were appalled when years ago our uh, daughter in sixth grade in Fairfax County schools, uh, as touted as well as they were, got no science because they're, and I'll have to say female, uh, teacher for, in sixth grade didn't like science, so she didn't teach science, oh, no. period. It was just zeroed out, out of the curriculum. Mm -hmm. The other point uh, is that we have, to, we have to look at the cultural biases that start almost with pink and blue ribbons, you know, mm -hmm. in the maternity mm -hmm. ward. Yeah. Um, and I, I, I was thrilled to meet two young ladies uh, about a year ago uh, who both have daughters who were frustrated that all the neat clothes for little kids, uh, the truck stuff and the rocket stuff and the math stuff was all in the boys' uh, department. So they designed some dresses and stuff for their own uh, daughters, uh, started selling them out to, to friends and neighbors and whatnot, and decided to see if there was a market for this. So they went on Kickstarter to raise 35000 They raised 225000 
and it's still growing. And it's because people are looking for stuff that you can't find with the cultural biases. We're starting to break that down in the toy aisle. I think they're getting around some of the gender-based toys. But all those things contribute to what are the attitudes that kids have growing up as to what can I do, what can I be? I think, yeah, it's really a fundamental point. It really ties back to, you know, why we're bringing the history, thinking about the children, you know, and right there, three-year-old playing with a toy. Um, one of the challenges, you, you know, with early Star Wars, six movies, only two women. You know, yeah. our, or you said, we said Star That's Trek. Awesome. We used to play all Star Trek when I was a kid, so everybody would be characters, and so I was Scotty, you know, because. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <That's here. laughs> so, but there's, there weren't enough girls, so it's, yeah. it's a perfect point. I, so, yeah. Well, even not in a non computing sphere, there have been times, I'm an actress as well, where I'm like, you don't show the female characters working. It's yeah. to Gina Davis's point. Mm -hmm of how few uh, female characters, in, especially in children's education, but throughout, like mm -hmm. you don't show women at work. And, um, and that sends a messaging to girls. And, but and there, to boys. Yeah, too. and to boys of the, what you expect from gender roles. But there are companies like Goldie Blocks, I don't know if you about know, that's mm -hmm. a company that yeah. is, is uh, aiming, it's like CS for girls. And um, I, I saw you last at the White House Champions of Change event for computer science. And there were remarkable teachers from around the country. Yeah. And I was saying to you as well, there was one teacher who is a Spanish teacher at a school in New York who got two weeks of computer science training and decided to integrate CS into her Spanish class. And she also did digital dance. Yeah. So they were like, you know, the BB-8, like Spiro's dancing <laughs> and stuff. And it was awesome. And, you know, streamers are, are done. <laughs> She's like, that's what they're doing. So, so you know, you said something about... Um, teachers being the role model. One thing that I think that is really important, I, I tutor math, um, uh, for, for, I volunteer tutor math, and I, what I've seen over the years is that the kids come to, uh, when it gets hard is when algebra two, algebra, algebra two starts, and, and, and they don't quite understand, and so what happens is schools tend to push the kids through. Well, you know, you got a B minus, is good enough, you get through, and what happens is when you don't understand something, you get discouraged. You get discouraged to the point where you don't want to go there. So that it is actually incumbent on the schools and the teachers to pay attention to each student, and every kid is different. It doesn't mean that you know if everybody completed uh, algebra in seventh grade, it's a good school. It, it means that you push some kids that may not be ready for that curriculum to go through, and that's also uh, very discouraging for the kids. So to answer the question about teachers being role models, absolutely. The other part is the kid has to be ready. And I think that is one thing that we are, and at least in Montgomery County where I live, they actually have this exam where so huge percentage have failed the high school you know, uh, HSA exams and, and they're trying to figure out why. And part of it is because if you pa pass these kids, they may understand it just for that term and then they won't internalize it. Yeah, someone who, uh, not Gavin Newsom was saying, it's, it's strange how we organize our children by date of manufacture for their <laughs> education. You know, so we can remix it and think differently, yeah. I, I just want to share that there seem, there are role models all around us. Teachers are great role models, but we don't seem to share as many of the stories of women. We don't show them at work. We also, we're surrounded by women with technology stories, with science stories. Every time I show the computers about the ENIAC programmers, I always have people coming up and talking about their great aunt who inspired them or their grandmother. And I'm like, have you captured that story? So for some reason, we know the stories. And when we do, they affect us personally. And they open the doors into science and technology when we know somebody personally. So, but we're surrounded by role models. And we're not encouraging the women to talk. Uh, they become invisible. So. Um, you know, it, it's part of something we should all be doing, yes. and it, it's capturing these stories and sharing them so that everyone knows that you know the path has been blazed ahead of us in technology and in science by women and by men. We just seem to only know half the story. Yeah, it's so it's such a great it's a good point for us. We'll we'll end on that, and I think the you know Rosie Rios is the U.S. Treasurer, and she and the Secretary have been working on. Um, this idea of women on money, like how do we celebrate who's in our statues, who's in our books, who, who are there. Uh, and they, they have talked about bringing women to money. Um, and so uh, it's interesting because when that announcement went out, she got a, an email from her history teacher uh, from Hayward High School. And, uh, 
And he said, you know, I've just walked in my classroom and I, I teach American history and I don't have any women on the walls. Mm -hmm. and, he, and so it was really poignant for him and he was quick, quickly correcting it, but he had no intention, of course, to do that. And I think whether it's in tech or in general, the Bechdel test, the Bechdel test is a test for films which says, if you're watching a film and it has uh, two women in the cast, major minor, they have a conversation with each other during the film and it's not about a man. So if it can meet those three criteria, <laughs> it passes the really Bechdel test. Bar. And if only about half of the films right now in movie theaters can pass that test. So it's a challenge that we have to have. So um, I wanted to really uh, thank our hosts, you know, the, the archives, it's such an incredible group. Um, and, uh, also, it, it's really, um, you know, to have uh, William McGowan, uh, you know, he is part of this idea mm -hmm. of innovation, you know, and, and his spirit lives on with this, with, with this idea of focus on women and on innovation. I know you focus on wireless, I think, in, in the fall, which is great. And Corey Zark is here for my team. And so thanks to everyone. I just, I also wanted to note um, visibility, and uh, I don't know if Nadia is in, in the, uh, is here still. Nadia Murad, are you here? So uh, Nadia is a young woman who's visiting us uh, from Europe right now, but um, I just wanted to thank her for being here and for coming to visit the State Department. Nadia is, uh, just some background on her, her, her family was killed by ISIL and she uh, was taken into their custody and, and uh, faced great challenges in sex slavery and other things and she's come to speak out. And so I'm so proud of her for being here. And uh, it's, you know, back to stories, all of our stories, whether these stories of the history in all of us and the power of all of us and the power of you. And so thank you for being here and, uh, and sharing your story and helping us fight against this. And I would say that it is interesting to me that we're talking about all the things of technology and how we need to be fluent and also in this fight against ISIL and countering violent extremism and keeping the greatness of our culture you know, our culture of peace and inclusion and love and, uh, and uh, passion for what we want to make in the world and change in the world and be part of that in the world. And the, the tools, the superhero tools of our time include these digital tools. And we stand on the shoulders of Hopper, of the ENIAC women, uh, of Anita Borg, of Katherine Johnson, um, and so many people. So thank you so much for being here tonight, and thank you to the archives and our archivists and, and our foundation partners. Thank you.